epic enough? Well, this machine is epic in every way. And if I had a pound for every time I'd been asked to make a video on the CS80, I'd have at least £7.50 by now. This instrument is that special, and this is going to be an in-depth look at a heavyweight beast, both physically and sonically. One thing though, if you want a playing only video, look elsewhere. I am as fascinated by the historical context of the 80 as I am by its sonic potential. So if that's not your thing, turn off now. Sounds like Vangelis. The CS Polysynth Trio were introduced in the mid to late 70s. They followed Yamaha's initial foray into synthesis with the monophonic SY1 and SY2. Technically, the SY monosynths have more in common with the GX1 technology, an instrument which eclipsed the CS80, certainly in physical form. But given the EX1, GX1 and HX1s are more organs than pure synthesizers, we're going to ignore them. Instead, the trio of CS50, CS60 and CS80 were Yamaha's announcement that the Japanese had arrived and were very serious about synthesis. Indeed, there's a rumour that Yamaha lost money on each CS80 sold. Instead, they used it as a statement as to how seriously they were going to take the pro synthesizer market. That said, there are so many myths that have grown up around the 80 that this could be another one of them, so don't take it as gospel. The CS50 was a lower price 4 voice polysynth. The CS60 was a mid price 8 voice polysynth. And the CS80 was a high price 8 voice polysynth. In the UK in 1978, a new CS80 was a cool £4,995. That's 25k in 2020. The differences between the three models were marked, but fundamentally, the CS50 had 13 presets playable from a Synth Action 49 note keyboard with aftertouch. An additional preset button activated the synth controls on the front panel and allowed you to create your own sounds. It did not have a ribbon strip, unlike the CS60 and 80. The CS60 comprised of a 61 note synth action keyboard, again with aftertouch. It had 12 presets ranging from strings to funky, and as per the 50, another switch marked panel that again allowed you to create your own sounds. There was also one more button marked memory, and this activated a duplicate set of front panel synth parameters in miniature which could be found under a flap on the top left of the instrument. It also had a ribbon strip, and this alone made it considerably more desirable than the 50. Now it's often said that the CS60 is effectively half a CS80, and while that's partly true, the 80 is way more than simply two 60s. For starters, the 80's frequency range extends to 8kHz, as opposed to 4kHz with the 50 and 60. The CS80 shared the same synth engine as its lesser relatives, but it was also a massive step up in many ways. Firstly, there were indeed two synth sections, an upper synth section and a lower section. Now you could use these independently or you could mix the two. It also had 61 keys, but instead of being synth action keys, these were weighted. It also had aftertouch. However, instead of what we now know as channel aftertouch, where pressing harder on one key introduces the same effect across all keys, particularly noticeable within a chord where the entire sound would change even though you only applied pressure to a single note, the 
the CS80 had polyphonic aftertouch. This means that when you play a chord, you can pick out an individual note within that chord and effect solely that note. Now this can introduce an incredible amount of expression into your playing and honestly once you've experienced it, life is never the same. The CS80 has 11 presets per layer. And while each layer's presets are different, they are grouped into categories offering variations on a theme. This time the buttons are illuminated as opposed to the cheaper buttons on the CS50 and 60. And again, one button on each layer activates the appropriate panel controls. Upper and lower. It also provides two memories per layer, four memories in total. As per the 60, the micro controls to create the sound allocated to each memory can be found under a flap at the top left of the instrument. Now while this method of storing memories is archaic, to put it into context, the only other polysynth with memories available in 1977 was the Oberheim 4 and 8 voice, which could only memorize certain global controls, not the settings of the controls on the individual SEMs. Also, if you wanted a uniform polyphonic sound across all four or eight voices, each SEM would have to be set up identically, something almost impossible given the vagaries of analogue back then. Essentially, until the release of the Prophet 5 in 1978, the CS60 and the CS80 offered the most elegant form of patch storage, albeit limited. The first thing we're going to do is look at the synthesizer mix or layer parameters and it might come as a surprise to know that these are actually quite simple. Firstly, we have two oscillator waveforms available, pulse and saw. Pulse waveform parameters offer us control over the pulse width, ranging between 50% and 90%. The pulse width modulation slider then works with a speed slider to give us proper pulse width modulation. The speed can go from very slow to super fast and this alone allows us to coax all manner of sounds from the one waveform switch. We also have a saw waveform, which can work alongside the pulse wave or independently. Now, there's no level or balance control between each waveform, so essentially you are stuck with their relative levels. Finally, in the VCO section, there is a noise slider. One of my favourite things is to use this with the ring modulator to create a living, breathing, organic sound. But more of that later. Nearly all of the original CS range of synthesizers featured both independent high-pass and low-pass filters, the exception being the tiny little CS01. And while there's resonance available for both modes, neither of them stray into self-oscillation territory. In fact, the filters are simple 12 dB per octave filters, and while they're versatile enough, they are not what you would call powerful. But what I find fascinating is that when certain more powerful filters have become almost fetishized over the years, even with its somewhat lowly filters, the CS can still create beautifully deep and moving sounds. As you'd expect though, the permutations of both a high-pass filter and low-pass filter are huge. The 
filter envelope is really interesting, especially these first controls called IL and AL. Now, I've got to be honest here and tell you that while I know they stand for initial level and attack level, I'm not 100% sure how to describe them, and I kind of quite like that. To my ears, they're akin to a filter envelope depth control, and my theory is somewhat substantiated by the fact that with them both at the low setting, there is no change in filter attack even when you move the filter attack slider. To introduce some real filter attack, you must juggle both the IL and AL sliders to give you the amount of envelope depth and an initial filter start level. The rest of the envelope controls are standard three-stage affair with decay and release, and the resulting sound is then fed into the VCF level control. Next up is a sine wave slider. Now this bypasses all the VCF controls and can be used to add some oomph to the overall sound. By turning down the VCF level control, you can also use this in isolation. And if you refer to the opening piece, those bell-like tones were created using only the sine wave in isolation. The VCA envelope is a standard four-stage affair, just giving you control over attack, decay, sustain, and release. Finally, in this section, there is a VCA level slider for the output. Lastly, we have the touch controls, which provide a brilliance control and a level control for the initial velocity of your notes. And exactly the same for aftertouch. If you want to have a flat response across all notes, i.e. no velocity and a fixed brightness, bring them all down to zero. But if you want to have a more dynamic response, you will set these accordingly. And for the panel controls, that's largely it. It's worth noting that these panel controls only take effect when the panel button is activated. You cannot use these to change or edit any of the presets. For those, you'll be limited to the global controls, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, as I explained earlier, unlike the CS50 and 60, which have one set of synth panel controls, the CS80 has two. The upper set are defined as mix one, and the lower set are defined as mix two. And then these are balanced in the global controls via the aptly named mix control. Again, more on this in a moment, but let's quickly set up a sound on the lower mix for when that time arrives. Okay, so now we have a sound in both mix one and mix two. So let's have a look at the global section. First, we have a split pitch knob. The inner knob is effectively used as a global fine-tune of the instrument, 
while the outer ring is a coarse tune and can also take care of performance based pitch bend duties in the absence of a dedicated pitch wheel. Next is the detune panel and here you offset the tuning of mix 2. The CS50, the CS60 and CS80 are all equipped with the same ring modulator. Now I think this is the most musical and one of the best ring modulators ever made. In fact, it's so good I could probably talk for an hour on this, but we're going to come back to this later. So for now, let's just move on to the sub oscillator section, which is effectively your LFO. Now here we have a choice of four waveforms. Sine, saw down, saw up and square, plus noise and the ability to use an external signal. Once the waveform is selected, you then have control over the LFO rate, plus destinations of VCO pitch, VCF frequency and VCA level. Next up are the transpose options for each layer or mix. These are 16 feet, 8 feet, 5 and a third, i.e. a fifth up from 8 feet, 4 feet, 2 and 2 thirds, i.e. a fifth from the 4 foot, and 2 feet. Again, this is per layer, so the permutations can be immense. For the moment, we'll skip the presets and go straight to the mix control, which as I explained earlier, balances the audio levels of mix 1 and mix 2. Here's mix 1, and here's mix 2. And here's a mix of both. Aside from its obvious use, this is really great when you say use an 8 foot in mix 1, and a five and a third in mix two. Then you can favor mix one more than mix two to get a very subtle fifth. Now we get to the global filter which is a lovely resonant low pass filter and helps you sculpt and solidify your overall patch. Just like the mix filters, this will not self oscillate, but the range is impressive and even slight adjustments have a noticeable effect on our overall sound. The initial pitch control allows us to create a rise up to the final pitch of a note depending on how hard we hit the note. I've got to say that while this is interesting, in the 80s there was a pop obsession with China and Japan and this was completely overused, especially when topped off by playing in fifths. But hey ho, that's probably just me. There's um, a, a, a pitch bend, is it? <laughs> 
See, yeah, when you press it hard, you get a more of a. If you disconnect one half, there's two banks of eight. Right? Just disconnect that function from one half, and you get the straight one with the with the bent one, and it gives you a a zap at the start of the note because it's out of tune. Usually it's on um, da da da. Da, 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 da. All that is a CSA, it's not brass at all. You wouldn't know. Moving on, we see the touch response or after touch controls. Now, here we can set a different speed to the LFO speed already selected previously. Then, when we press harder on a key and implement the after touch, it will control VCO pitch and VCF frequency. Remember, this is all relative to the LFO section. Finally, for the global section, we have keyboard control. The green controls set the overall brightness or brilliance of the sound across the keyboard range. Lastly, in this section, the grey controls work in the same way as the brilliance controls. Only this time, we're talking about setting levels for high and low parts of the keyboard. I love this control because we can create patches with really high level bottom end for those deep raspy aftertouch sounds, and then set a more tamed and moderate high end. indeed vice versa. As I explained earlier, the global controls are the only way of editing the presets. You cannot use any of the synth panel parameters with presets. These are only active when panel mode is selected. However, there's still a lot you can do with the global controls and presets, and I'll be honest here, that's a good thing, because many of the presets are really nothing to write home about, and a few are probably pretty grim. I'll run through those shortly, but I think it's about time to introduce you to the ribbon strip. This is pitch only, but it is nothing short of magnificent. If you play a note and place your finger on the ribbon, the initial position of your finger on the ribbon strip becomes the center point from which you bend up or down. A full bend up from bottom to top is one octave, but a full bend down from top to bottom is so far off the charts that we've popped sub basses. When using the ribbon strip, there is something that I think is the work of genius. And that's when you use it with the sustain mode on the panel to the left of the keyboard. 
In sustain mode 2, when you play and use the ribbon, it applies pitch bend to everything. However, in sustain mode 1, only held notes are affected. And this means you can play a chord with a long release, lift your fingers and then play and affect notes with the ribbon controller that are subsequently held. You can also use the ribbon to play trills, and here's something I did a while ago on the CS60 that will give you an idea of how expressive this can be. Here's another technique that you may have heard somewhere before, demonstrated by Kent. So now we've got a handle on the panel and global controls, let's return to the ring modulator. As I said earlier, this is a thing of genius. Now here's MAD with both speed and mod full on. And backing off the speed gives us subtle modulation. And anything in between. We also have attack, decay and depth controls, effectively applying an envelope to the ring modulator. As I said earlier, one of my favourite things is to apply some noise to one of the mixes, then set up the ring modulator and envelope so that we get this kind of breathy sound that slows down via the ring modulator envelope to a kind of slow breathing. We can then use the attack to apply instant ring mod that dies away to a more subtle level, or we can have a slow attack to give a ramp in. Again, the permutations are endless. And what's amazing about the controls here, and indeed all the global controls, is that even though they're relatively short throw sliders, there's so much detail in very subtle adjustments. With the CS80, the ring modulator processes both mixes 1 and 2. And because of this, effectively making it stereo, there is a noticeable drop in audio level when you first activate it. You do not get this with the 50 and 60 because they're mono. Oh, and when we put the ring modulator to use with the ribbon strip in a performance capacity,
Okay, let's go back to those presets and check them out. But note that it is the law to run a CS80 through a reverb at least 60% of the time. And in this case, I'm using the Strymon Blue Sky pedal. Okay, first up, string one in mix one. As I said, not amazing in isolation. But let's use the global controls to edit it. Transpose it up. Add some pitch modulation. And mess with those filters a bit. Then, in terms of aftertouch, we can add a faster pitch vibrato. A little bit more VCF. And that's not bad when playing a mono line, a tri-poly line. Okay, that's alright, considering we're only using one layer, but here's the reason for the reverb law. Let's try that again with the Strymon off. And quickly on again before the reverb police turn up. String 2 is in the lower section, so to hear it in isolation, we'll move the mix solely to mix 2. Again, not great. In fact, not great even when mixed with string one. For me, string three is the best of the bunch, especially when transposed up. And with the global filter closed down a bit, and a little bit of vibrato courtesy of the ribbon. String 4 on mix 2. So just when you're thinking these presets are a bit of a letdown, along come the iconic ones namely Brass 1 and Brass 2. Instant Blade Runner and Chariots of Fire. Or with some serious reverb and a muted filter, still gorgeous. I'm not going to play too much of this for fear of the copyright police, but you get the idea as to how expressive some of these preset based patches can be. Actually, only the flute is used in the opening scene of Blade Runner, played here by the very capable Kent.
Likewise, electric piano and bass play together, another iconic patch used in John and Vangelis's I Hear You Now. And then it's back to the terminally average clavy 1 and clavy 2. Harpsichord 1 and harpsichord 2 are probably cool for classical players, but... Organ 1 and 2 are reasonable patches though. And with Organ 2 transposed up an octave. To the Unknown Man by Vangelis was done using guitar 1 and 2. Next up are the funky presets, which I remember people laughing at at the time, but they're pretty good all in all. In fact, as a Stevie Wonder fan, I know he used the 80 on Quincy Jones' album The Dude. In fact, the riff from Betcha Wouldn't Hurt Me is Funk 1 CS coupled with the bass preset. Now this is probably the same sound used on Ebony and Ivory too, but let's not ruin a good moment, eh? <laughs> And if you take electric piano and funky four, add a bit of that cheesy initial pitch bend I talked about earlier, and you've got the memory buttons are self-evident, and as I said before, these are created via the controls under this panel. Obviously these are short throw sliders, but you can get close enough to a sound initially created on the front panel. Then we have the panel buttons, and this is where I spend most of my life. But as we've already been through the panel, we'll move on to the panel on the left of the keyboard. Firstly, we have modifications that our master tech installed for us, namely MIDI and the unison mode. Now this is dynamic unison, so playing one note will fire off all eight voices on both mixes at once. And then this gets divided down the more notes you play simultaneously. Now I don't use this that much, but it's great for choppy parts where you want the bass to really cut through, but chords to be slightly more tamed. The 80 also came with an expression pedal, and using this button, you basically turn that expression pedal into a wah that changes both the volume 
and sweeps the filter cutoff points while boosting the resonance. <laughs> There was also a hold pedal, which via these buttons can activate sustain, set in accordance with the yellow sustain slider. And portamento or glissando, which is switchable via this rocker switch, but which is only activated when the hold pedal is pressed. Now I've already talked about the sustain modes and the ribbon, but mode one also allows you to sustain each note individually, while mode two ends the sustain of previous notes when a new chord or voice is played. This is great for uncluttered lead lines, while mode one is the one that I would use for pads, etc. Finally, we have onboard effects. Tremolo and chorus plus knobs for rate and depth. And that's it, the CS80 controls in a nutshell. And it should be evident by now that I think this machine is a thing of beauty. If you just take the synth section, it is nothing stunning. But it's the way all of the sections interact with each other that makes this magnificent. There are so many parts that go to make it special, and it is the living, breathing example of the phrase, more than the sum of its parts. The ring mod the ribbon strip, the poly aftertouch, even the keys. This is no average key bed. Just look at the size of a single key. Oh, and it's plastic, not wood, like some people think. In the interest of balance, I should note a few of its failings from my perspective. Firstly, it's heavy. Now I remember using one in my 20s and being able to lug it around single-handedly. Now I'm older, moving it is a total pain in the arse and I wouldn't even attempt to do it on my own. Oh, and do you want to hear the best joke about the CS80? CS stands for Compact Synthesizer, despite the fact it weighs 100 kilos. Secondly, tuning. To tune the damn thing you've got to open it up and set the tuning of each voice card and this is an epic job. However, once set up, provided it has the second generation VCOs, it is a lot more stable than people think. Thirdly, it draws 180 watts, and the heat generated is noticeable when you use it for any length of time. Fourthly, the repair bills. Now, this is an instrument that you are just the custodian of for a period of time, and obviously it's part of the deal to keep it in tip-top condition. Fortunately, we have a fantastic tech, Mr. Kent Spong, who's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know about this instrument, certainly technically, and who contributed hugely to this video. He also has a brilliant tutorial on how to tune the instrument. If you own an 80 or are thinking about owning one, check it out. But with parts becoming rare now, you're looking at money every time one of those custom ICs pop. Fifth, and this is a personal gripe mentioned previously. 
Whereas when you activate the ring modulator on the CS50 and 60, there's no discernible loss of level, on the 80 there is. Finally, the price. At the time of this video, you are talking upwards of £20,000 for a good, fully working one. Which is actually quite amusing because, as I mentioned at the start, in 1978 they cost the equivalent of £24,000 today. That means that if you bought one back then and you kept it in good condition, you'd have had 40 years worth of use out of it and could still sell it for about what you paid. It's not bad, eh? There's also one other thing about this instrument, namely that it became so synonymous with Vangelis' work, it's sometimes difficult to play it without someone commenting, Yeah, nice Dave, sounds like Vangelis. And because they're very expensive to buy now, sometimes the last thing you really want to hear, having spent a small fortune, is... <sighs> yeah, it just sounds like Vangelis, Dave. On the other hand, that might be exactly what you do want to hear. Because let's face it, he more than used it, he championed it and he made it world famous. Just play the opening notes of Chariots of Fire on an 80 in front of a few friends of a certain age to see if I'm lying. But there are legions of others out there who made the instrument their own. Indeed, ours originates from Jeff Wayne, who was given it, yep, given it, by David Essex. It was then used on War of the Worlds alongside the heavily modified CS80, belonging to our keyboard hero and string machine inventor, Ken Freeman. The bass line. I, I wrote that. <laughs> Other names? Well, Billy Curry with Mr X, Steve Winwood, Ark of a Diver, Eddie Jobson. Just listen to UK's Alaska. This is like a seminal CS80 piece. Gary Sanctuary, Incognito's Jazz Funk album, Peter Gabriel on So, Michael Jackson, Thriller. In fact, reportedly, Michael Jackson played the vamp to Billie Jean in one take on the 80. Brian Eno, Richard Tandy from ELO, Peter Howell for the Doctor Who theme, Larry Dunn from Earth, Wind & Fire, Kate Bush on the Never Forever album, 10CC on Tourist Bloody Tourists, the sublime intro to If You Don't Love Me by Prefab Sprout. More recently though, David Arnold said he used it on Good Omens and Dracula, Ty Unwin on Midger's orchestrated album, and Hans Zimmer on Black Hawk Down, Batman Begins and Blade Runner 2049. Oh, and me. Yes, I used it on the forthcoming Amorphous Androgynous record. And while I know I'm a nobody, the point is, when I play this thing, I feel like one of the luckiest people alive, and occasionally I have to pinch myself. Which all goes to prove that in my eyes, and the eyes of others, the CS80 is one of, if not the most iconic, beautiful, enchanting and expressive polyphonic synths ever made.
again, it just sounds like Vangelis. 